In the third century BC, Rome and Carthage were engaged in a battle for supremacy in the Western Mediterranean, a conflict that would lead to more than a century of military confrontations, the so-called Punic Wars. After the defeat of Carthage in the first of these wars, and with Roman ships dominating the seas, a large army of troops departed towards the coast of Hispania. One after another, quinqueremes and triremes were sailing towards the inlet. Beautiful painted helmets, standing on end by innumerable lines of powerful oars. From their bowels came forth men, animals, and weaponry. 60,000 infantrymen, 8,000 horsemen, 200 elephants, a troop of battle-hardened Carthaginians under the command of Hasdrubal the Fair, son-in-law of Hamilcar Barca, supreme commander of Carthage. Thousands of souls committed to the adventure of creating a strategic fortification from which they could prepare future attacks against their most hated enemy, Rome. Poseidon was snoozing. The sea shone like an incandescent crystal on nymphs and sea nymphs. The will of the gods was at peace. But what of men? Strong arms powered the will of those solid boats that darkened the shadows on the horizon. Then, great sails made to billow by no less than Neptune himself cheered on that wondrous fleet of fast-moving vessels. besiege Cartago Nova. 25,000 infantrymen, 2,500 horsemen, ladders, assault towers, orders to attack. The powerful machinery of Roman warfare ready to strike in combat. Scipio Africanus showed his magnanimity before the surrender of the enemy. He ordered the killings to stop. The plundering of the booty commenced. The boats were full of shining silver, and the streets full of black death.
the din of war, the music of victory, and silence. Silence in honor of the fallen. I've always loved these holy pressings. To walk among lives that have gone before us, to read inscriptions and imagine what their existence was like. Sometimes sadness awakens the happiest of yearnings. The youth of a boy in Imperial Cartago Nova. The virtuous enclave. The city touched by the magical muse of Mercury. Cartago Nova, splendorous and sensuous, born out of the epic days of war and peace. Tradesmen and business people, comedians and musicians, gods and men, freemen and slaves, all of them representing in unison the formidable pageant of life. were open to the light in the calm era of the Emperor Claudius. The gods looked kindly enough on me to grant that I be born into an honorable Roman family. My mother was Octavia Lucana. She was a woman of noble birth, educated and refined. I, Titus Albino, am her only son. My father, Marcus Albino, was a prosperous and respected businessman, a practical man of simple tastes. Tell me, Macius, who would you have been on in the next games? <clears throat> on my school always. Titus, shield yourself from attack. Fighting exercises, an unavoidable daily appointment. The master, Macius the Greek, director of a famed gladiator school. My father wanted to increase my incipient virility, distancing myself from what he called the dangerous femininity of the arts. But my skills and physical disciplines were not favored by Mars. If you don't shield yourself from attack, you'll be easy meat for scavengers. Good fight, my son. Thank you, father. Sure you don't need a young gladiator for your school? Father, I do as well as I can. Oh. They say that Ben Ali has trained invincible gladiators. That dog only trains beasts. Well, they say that Dardanus, the barbarian, has a terribly wicked sword. Some brave rat. That piece of vermin doesn't know what a clean fight is. Ah, so there are honorable fights between gladiators, good Macius? Marcus Albino, there is more honor on the amphitheater floor than in the entire Senate of Rome. <laughs> Whenever my father and Macius discussed bets and gladiators, my battered person was superfluous. And I would devote these times to my studies. Reading makes the man complete, my mother was often fond of saying. A time for study, which coincided with her offerings to the gods. Octavia was a skilled expert in mixing wine for libations. Some subtle skills which my father never managed to appreciate to their full extent. Octavia, what kind of ambrosia is this? Wine made from dates. 
Isn't it to your liking? Hmm, my darling wife's concoctions. Uh, do you want to try it, Titus? Today, I prefer water, Father. A wise decision. But it makes a splendid drink for Vesta. Hmm, it's very refined. I don't doubt it, but I have an unrefined palate. You know, son, I think it's important that you start taking on the business you'll inherit one day. <clears throat> and this? Wine with lotus and dates. Reminiscent to wine with honey. A special libation for Vulcan. Can't a man just drink ordinary wine in his home? You see, son, what's good for the gods isn't good for your father. That's because gods are immortal and I am not, Octavia. My dear husband, I respect you too much to argue against you. Besides, a multitude of words is no proof of a prudent mind, according to... Tales of Miletus? Magnificent. Have you noticed, Marcus? Our son is turning into quite a scholar. Titus, I want you to come with me to the forum. Today they're announcing who's won the contract to install the new water courses, and I want you to be there at my side. It's always a source of pride to be seen with my father. Wine made from rose petals. Ideal for Isis. Aromatic? Very aromatic. Titus, I expect to receive in the forum the favor of all the gods. <clears throat> in those days, the prosperity of the Albino family shone with the intensity of the brightest morning star. I've got it. I'll take it in. The harvest were abundant. My mother would say that, thanks to her libations, Ceres had been magnanimous. The stone walls of the mill could satiate their hunger for grain. The baker's shops were brimming over with flour and their ovens with crusty breads. Come in and see the most beautiful amphora in Cartago Nova. The Salvio family manufactured the pitchers and amphorae that were needed in order to successfully sell wine and oil. They also made pieces of crockery, delicate pieces produced by the fair hand of their daughter, the beautiful Lydia. My personality became pensive and I struggled for words when I was in her company. Although she was concentrating on shaping the clay, Lydia rewarded me with a wonderful smile from time to time. Had it not been for the echoes that resounded from the nearby noisy harbor, I would never have emerged from that sweet trance. Those were the beautiful days. Cartago Nova was growing and prospering thanks to its ideal location. Men and their assets arrived from the most distant places a seemingly inexhaustible wealth of fortune. Right. thanks to the gods. Hurry up with those bales! Have you seen such beautiful Wheat, fish? wine, oil, esparto grass, lead, and silver. Silver supplied with the same luster as stars. Majestic ships bore thousands of amphorae, 5,000, 10,000 even at times. And everywhere you looked, there were people engaged in heated bargaining and haggling. Souls who embraced one another upon meeting again. Take care of yourself. Hearts that went their own way after farewells. Once again, the symphony of life was playing out before my very eyes in all its splendor. And me, insatiable as ever, 
took it all in as the greatest of good fortune. Happy to find myself among the living. Happy to enjoy that proud and voluptuous Cartago Nova. That day, the forum was teeming noisily. Crowds, icons, revered statues, everything overpowered my spirit. That day, strange gossip had overtaken tongues and ears. I'm sure that Lucius Andros will win. Well, I'm inclined to go for Marco Albino. But my That's darling something. Lydia was there to encourage us. There you have Lucius Andros and his henchmen, venomous snakes of the worst kind. Citizens of Cartago Nova, we hereby pronounce the edict by which the Honorable Du Umveri proclaim judgment on the new water channeling works. A bad omen, Titus. The two respectable citizens who have tendered their bids are, on the one hand, Marcus Albino, and on the other, Lucius Andros. By way of this edict, it is determined that due to the similarity of the bids tendered, the award is declared invalid. So who's he bribed this time? A snake. That's what he is. By way of offering a final verdict, the magistrates of the Curia have decreed that the Honorable Lucius Andros and Marcus Albino must compete against each other. They will both build fountains here in the Forum Square. The final contractor of the project will be the one who finishes building his first. The water emanating from them must be healthy and suitable for public use. Nobody foresaw a dispute like that developing, but the unexpected and uncertain nature of the tender caused bets to be placed and made melancholic spirits happy again. I'm sure Lucius Andrews has what it takes to get the job. Well, I'm for Marcus Albino. How much do you want to bet? Our character is dictated by our conduct, Aristotle entreated. On a day where the gods had stirred up a sea of doubt, there was nothing better to calm the spirit than the splendid and enjoyable baths of Cartago Nova. Cold, cool, or hot water soothed the most agitated of spirits. A meeting place where convivial discussions were held, sometimes. They say the greatness of a man is seen by the importance of his enemies, noble Marcus Albino. The fates of the present day have decreed it so, respected Lucius Andros. My dear friends, what should we think of someone who bites the hand that feeds him? Your offended person seems to forget who discovered the bed. Who saved him from destitution, and thanks to whom he is now the owner of a successful silver mine. The most productive of all those being worked in Cartago Nova. Which has made you rich as it has me. Prudence tends to be absent just when it is most needed. But the watchful eyes of my brave father never discovered the true reasons for Publilius Cyrus. At least I'd like to be an associate of yours because I never charged any interest. Half of everything shouldn't have been a bad reward for the charitable Lucius. Ah, what ingratitude, Ben Ali, and what insolence. Offensive words lose their virtue when spoken by Lucius Andros. Huh?
I can see you don't want to be my associate any longer. Not for a day longer, if the gods are looking on me favorably. Everyone here is a witness to what I'm about to propose. Whoever wins the challenge of the fountains shall keep the part of the mine belonging to the loser. That way, we'll cease to be partners and we'll come to be again good friends. May Jupiter put a seal on your words, and so be it. The dispute over the fountains gave rise to innumerable predictions and bets. In the baths and in my own house, peace was already an absent tenant. The lifeblood of Cartago Nova was lovingly embraced by the solid but sleek aqueduct. The water poured sweetly into a beneficial distribution channel, causing three beautiful receptacles to overflow. One that supplied the baths. Another that supplied the fountains and public pools. And lastly, the one that supplied water to the houses. Through influence and bribes, the nearest and most profitable water connection was entrusted into the hands of Lucius. In addition, in order to build the water supply lines, he took possession of all the amphorae in Cartago Nova. And should the divine winds ever stop blowing in his favor, the old usurer acquired a true legion of slaves. Work, you dogs. Work faster. My father, a victim of the cold strategy of his opponent, could hardly find hands for hire. Fear of Lucius Andros was greater than the need for any amount of cesters. Besides, in terms of useful amphorae, those manufactured at the pottery workshop belonging to the good old Salvio were the only ones we had available. With even more disastrous consequences, Pluto caused the ground to abound with stones. Hoeing the soil turned into a slow and grueling task. My mother used to say that the gods had forsaken us, and that offerings and libations were to be made in order to get them back. Within a few days, and spurred on by the winged Mercury, the channeling system being built by Lucius gained ground on ours. Consider setbacks as an exercise. But in such distressful circumstances, Seneca's wisdom didn't provide the comfort the Albino family needed. So what is this delicacy, Octavia? It's a dish of my own invention, deliciously stuffed quail. Well, if these are quails. Yes, stuffed with brine-cured bitter olives. How are they? <laughs> bitter. I'll have some grapes. For sure they'll be safer. Marcus, do you know that it worries me to have Lucius Andros as an enemy? He's a vile person. If it were up to me, the gods well know that I would pass on the bet. Take it easy. You won't have to. It's practically lost anyway. It doesn't have to be like that, Father. I've studied our water connection and it... It's farther away than his. That shyster knew well what people he had to bribe to come out ahead. Yes, but it has the advantage of being higher with a gentler slope. 
On the other hand, Andro's connection has a very pronounced fall. Only on the first stretch. Father, I'm sure the source of the water will make the channel collapse. That should hold them back. But not enough. What's more, we can use lead instead of amphorae. Tubes made of lead? They are much stronger and much narrower. The ditches to be dug are smaller and therefore quicker to make. With the help of the gods, we'll make Hurry up for up. lost time. Let's join it. Like the lives of two lovers who yearned to reach the end of their days together, so ran the pipework of Lucius Andros and my father. The gods were unsure of on who they should bestow their favor. The graceful stork finished off the work of Marcus Albino beautifully. The magnificent lion immortalized the infamous nature of Lucius Andros. In the circumference, the beginning and end meet. Just as in the apt definition given by Heraclitus, the start and end points of the acrimonious works agreed to coincide. And Lucius's black shadow only spurred on the quarrel. Lead gave way to setbacks. Perhaps the gods had already decided their verdicts. and my predictions became reality, as if they had come out of an infallible oracle. And as if he were one of the sons of the god Esculapius, Salvius staunched the artery that obstructed the flow of our victory's lifeblood. But Lucius's men also showed great alacrity. Innumerable gazers inspected the two fountains. Which would be the first to pump water, the stork or the lion? And everyone's voice grew silent before the uncertain intervention of fate. And the water gushed out, cool and clear. And a cloak of victory cheers draped the Albino family. Congratulations! You made it! It has been a fair victory! The day before heralds the day which follows. So proclaims the wisdom of Pindar. We would always remember the day when a stork beat a lion and skill beat brute force. We would always remember that valiant deed in that virtuous enclave in Cartago Nova, splendorous and sensuous, born out of the epic days of war and peace. Everything fake falls away like faded flowers. But justice dealt by time doesn't prevent dishonorable events. Nero had governed Rome. 
the winds of decadence swept through the empire. In Cartago Nova, the days of prosperity seem a long way off now. Ceres, offended by human ingratitude, also inflicted her punishment. Five years of drought emptied the grain silos. Pluto, weary of us rummaging and digging around the bowels of his kingdom, vetoed the extraction of wealth. The silver mines became exhausted. Hunger and misery cast a dark shadow over the future. Fear took possession of Cartago Nova. There were robberies and assaults on dark nights. To escape from their hardship, the people attend spectacles and performances more than ever before. Everything is justified when it comes to cheer up their downcast spirits. The Curia ordered gladiatorial games to be held, a fleeting remedy for popular discontent. shows, fierce fights of animals against animals, of animals against humans. And above all, the most appreciated and awaited, gladiator fights. Men against men. Heated combats to the death. The ferocity in the arena soothed the rage of people facing adversity. Titus. Macius, if you don't shield yourself from attack, you'll end up as scavenger meat. Greek, will you accept him now into your school? You need something more than Ben Ali's ruses to get into my elite squadron. Get up, Macius. Take my arm. A gladiator gets up on his own or stays lying in the sand forever. Well done, lad. That's how you defend yourself. Titus, these tricks are unworthy of a disciple of mine. Well, I'd say they had your hallmark branded in fire. They're appalling tricks. Don't you even recognize the notches of your own sword? Bah! An outstanding apprentice of the scoundrel Ben Ali. That's what your son is, Marcus Albino. As usual, whenever one of their peaceful discussions was beginning, I slipped away discreetly, satisfied at having cast a beam of light into the fog of anxieties that surrounded my father. In the Albino family home, times of prosperity were long gone. Poor harvests, bad business, and bad luck 
which my mother Octavia's fervent libations didn't manage to lift. During those years, I was immersed in learning the wise disciplines of Vitruvius. According to the great master architect, buildings had to be attractive, practical, and durable. In order to understand the method of application of these concepts of harmony and balance, Octavia arranged for me to work as an unpaid assistant for three of Cartago Nova's most renowned architects. Gracchus Paetus was famous for his wisdom in producing both functional and practical works. Very well. Let's the, the renovation of the Curia building had been entrusted to his skillful charge. There isn't any justification at all for the chaos we are suffering. The Pax Romana extends to every corner of the Empire. How is it possible that it has been lost in our beloved Cartago Nova? We have to make our streets safe again. Our honor as Roman citizens demands this of us. Here, here. Well said. Another of my recognized teachers was Tullius Babius, an expert in creations where artistry stood out with a remarkable level of achievement. Maintenance work on the graceful and airy theater bore the hallmark of his handiwork. That front facade will be covered in marble. He had to enhance the stage of the proscenium, already spectacular up to that point. Titus, never forget the acoustics. Look, Titus, those columns will support the entire superstructure. 6,000 spectators would admire the skill of the brilliant Babius. And lastly, the most famous of all of Cartago Nova's architects, the great Licinius Didius. Outstanding knowledge of the strength of materials made him holder of the title of Architect of the Eternal. The imposing amphitheater was now under his command. The seating capacity had to be increased to 11,000 souls. My knowledge increased day by day in the shadow of the master. Unfortunately, Jupiter was not so hospitable when it came to bestowing good fortune on our family. The fish isn't very fresh. So I see, Octavia. Nowadays, it's hard to find anything at a decent price. Well, there's no dish a pinch of garum can't spice up. That's what you call a pinch, Father? Titus, this is Cartago Nova's true gold. Mmm, delicious. Yes, if one day you sold this in large quantities, you'd really be in business. Marcus. Don't you know that a young architect needs a much bigger place to study? Mother, I've told you it isn't necessary. Garum, more valuable than silver itself. I think there's a room that might do very well. It's large and with a lot of light. And besides, it won't ever run out. What about the one overlooking the garden? As long as there are fish. As a library, it would be perfect. That deaf dialogue was their way of hiding a normality which no longer existed. What was that phrase, Titus? If you've got a library with a garden... If you've got a library with a garden, you've got everything. That's it. And who said it? Cicero, dear mother. Fantastic memory. Marcus, don't you think that our future Vitruvius deserves that library? Titus, remember what your father says. One day, ships will leave here with thousands of amphorae filled with this subtle gem. 
But my father's vessels never made it to their port of call. Neptune charged for his favors with implacable brutality. Marcus Albino's wealth lit up the obscure depths of the abyss. My father had to resort to the city's most hated moneylender, Lucius Andros. One way or another, I'll keep my promise. These are difficult times, Marcus Albino. On my honor, I'll pay you back to the last sesters. The old man imposed interest rates ruthless in their usury. He showed no mercy to the only man who had stood up to him. Don't be afraid, Come here, sweetheart. Yeah. <laughs> Come here. Get your hand Cross up, you brute! <laughs> Leave her alone. You want to mess with me? Out of here, you How bastard. You show him some manners. Why don't you mind your own business? Teach him a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I always knew you and I would get around to doing business together again. Thank you. Marcus Albino, I always collect what is owed to me. Everyone knows Lucius Andrus always lived up to his well-earned reputation. Besieged by debt, my father freed his faithful artisan. The expert hands of Salvio would never again mold for him. And never again would we see Lydia's tender glance reflected in my father's noble expression. and tasteless when it doesn't come wrapped in a cure, said Plato. For the Albino family, the darkest fate was about to come calling. Father, they say the storm flung the boat onto the island rocks. Marcus, you can't go out in a night like this. The shipwrecks say that they were trying to reach the harbor for refuge. If it is true, it is our ruin, Octavia. But the streets aren't safe at night. Mother. Don't worry, I'll go with him. Titus, stay here. Wait, at least let your son go call Macius. Look after your mother. Deep inside, we both had a foreboding premonition. Everything fake falls away like faded flowers. But what about good people, wise Cicero? Why the noble and kind Marcus Albino? My father's lifeless body appeared after three days. Neptune, in his compassion, directed it to us. Some said it was a blow from the waves. But there were other voices that called for justice. 
A fake shipwreck, craftily plotted in the middle of the night. Alone, defenseless, attacked, beaten, cast into the sea as if it were an anguished suicide. It never became known what actually happened, but people said the shadow of Lucius Andros clouded the truth. funeral pyre burnt as was prescribed, without logs carved in honor of the deceased. The dying embers were put out with wine. There were no hired mourners, nor banquets. The noble ashes were collected, placed in a beautiful urn, and kept in an inconspicuous location. Lucius didn't respect the holy days of required mourning to claim our debt. My mother appeased him with properties. To die young is to squander life, a squandering done by the gods. Do you know, Octavia, in spite of our differences, I always respected your husband. Even when we were engrossed in bitter competition, I admired his valor. He was the only one bold enough to challenge me. The greatness of a person is seen in the importance of his enemies. Here you are. The mine is yours. Thank you. Only Jupiter knows how long I've been waiting for this, since that ill-fated day when your yearned husband won the bet. It was a good fight. No one doubted that it was, but to win it back. <laughs> After so many years, forgive me if my old heart is racing a bit. Is that all, Lucius? For the time being, dear Octavia, for the time being. Virtually without income, I was obliged to request a stipend from my masters. Only Licinius Didius accepted. Some time before, Rome had suffered a devastating fire. In the new city that rose from the ashes, the eternal architect had to take on an imperial project, and he left the completion of the works of Cartago Nova in my hands. Pulleys and platforms, stone and men, Occupied in my absorbing daily routine, I scarcely had time to dream of my beloved Lydia. Homo Plaki! If you don't shield yourself from attack, you'll end up as scavenger meat. And in the arena, Macius's gladiators were already exercising. The lavish games that would inaugurate the new amphitheater were nearly upon us. There was a Nubian gladiator who went by the name of Fabius. His feline agility was prodigious. But above all else, I admired his nobleness in combat. You'll be roadkill for vultures! Do you hear me, Homo Plaki? <laughs> nobleness isn't compassion, Nubius. There can't be any. In the arena, your life depends on victory. To hesitate means to die. The gladiator exercises were hard, even cruel at times. The spectator's favorite gladiators were owned by Macius. Twenty slaves, each one an expert in some form of combat. I would often go to the quarries. I would choose the ashlers from the very best veins. 
It was on one of those days that the gods shone a light on my destiny. I passed close by our small abandoned garum factory. In memory of my father, I took it upon myself to visit it. The store, by the will of the gods, was still full of unsold produce. For a long time, our family hadn't been capable of trading. The day before heralds the day which follows, but time nearly always plays against those most afflicted. We have to sell it, Titus. Mother, it's the Albino family home. But I can't pay Lucius. Remember what father used to say about Garum? The jewel of Cartagonova. You know, they're rebuilding Rome. Yes, and they say that the port of Ostia is back to business like the good old days. A cargo of this on its piers and... Do you think that the gods determine the aims of our sufferings over stagnant fish remains? And why not? The Garum Amphorae are small. And where would the Cestors needed to charter boats come from? But a boat can transport thousands of them. Son... Consolation is cold and tasteless when it doesn't come wrapped up in a cure. Plato's words in the mouth of my mother killed the idea. The garum, once again, was forgotten. But life went on, and the teacher returned. Licinius Didius praised the way the project was carried out. He even offered me work in Rome. According to him, I was ready to fly alone. If you don't shield yourself from attack, you'll end up as scavenger meat. Back to work, He who hesitates perishes. Do you hear me, Homo Blackie? You'll be roadkill for vultures. In the arena, your life depends on victory. To hesitate is to die. Are you all right, Macius? It's a miracle of the gods. A gladiator only gets up by himself or remains in the arena forever. Titus, I owe you my life. These stones are my business. It's me who owes you an apology. Choose the gladiator you want. He's yours. Macius, you don't owe me anything. Accept it. I repeat, you owe me nothing. You don't want to accept the honor of a grateful man. But Macius, I know nothing about gladiators. I'll keep on training him. But in the games, he'll be fighting for you. Do you like this one? You know I never bet on fights. With the help of your gods and mine, he'll be able to cover you in gold. You win. I choose that one. Fabius. Yeah, he's good. But he's way too noble. Look at this one. Strong. Absolutely merciless. He'll fight for you to the death. If I have to choose one, I'd prefer this one. Ah, stubborn like his father. He would never accept advice. I'd have covered him in gold if he paid attention. Come on, Fabius. You've got yourself a new master. I had never been excited about the gladiatorial games. But supposing all the fates conspired for the gods to smile on us. Old Macius was not short on reason. Should Fabius emerge victorious, we'd win enough to charter a ship for the Garum. And if not, what would it matter anyway? To call on favorable omens was never inconvenient, my mother proclaimed. Minerva, Jupiter's daughter, goddess of war and also of peace, benefactor of the arts and sciences, became the object of our libations and sacrifices. Prudence tends to be absent just when it is most needed. Had my family reflected on the wise warning of Publilius Cyrus, we would never have gambled our scant possessions on those ridiculous games.
And there he was, the sinister Lucius, willing to watch his ill-gotten and blood-soaked gains increase. The sword of his faithful Ben Ali would meet that of our good Macius. Lucius Andros placed huge bets in favor of Dardano's sword, the invincible Mermillo. As for us, all our hopes were pinned on the net and trident of the noble Fabius. All the water in the rivers won't be enough to wash away the blood-stained hand of a murderer. But there was no room for the noble Asculus in that ruthless Roman arena of suffering and death. Ben Ali's ferocious Mermillo was annihilating Macius's gladiators. Lucius got richer with every successive death. How do you look into the eyes of those whose life is at your mercy? What words can you say to those about to go out and fight to the darkest of deaths? For someone in that position, there is only one possible satisfaction, freedom. That was what I swore to the worthy and noble Fabius. Our character is a result of our behavior. To the indisputable Aristotle, I would add, and our death is a consequence of how we have lived. Fabius obtained his freedom. The Garum reached Rome. And the Albino family finally achieved the dignity of being at peace.
many flowering seasons have come and gone. Before my very eyes, landscapes and people have mutated. But still today, on sunny days, I wander through the forum and remember my parents. Now that my tired bones feel the call of the earth, my soul finds comfort in the fact that they will repose for all eternity next to theirs. Sometimes, sadness awakens the happiest of yearnings. The youth of a boy in Imperial Cartago Nova. I see Lydia, and by her hand I enter the magical harbor that captivated me as a child. And once more, the joy in gazing at boats and amphorae, souls and hearts, hugs and farewells, and again in my feelings, that absorbing and insatiable symphony of life, splendorous and sensuous Cartago Nova, the virtuous enclave of the gods, the beloved city of the eternal stones. <laughs> 